Hello, I am Miss Penelope Pembroke and I am the drama teacher here at the Shropshire Country School and I welcome you to our sixth form students production of The Importance of Being Earnest by Mr. Oscar Wilde. We've chosen to present this classic comedy in reader's theatre style in order to maintain proper distance for safety purposes. What is reader's theatre style, you may ask? Well, reader's theatre is any kind of group dramatic reading, a style popular in the 1800s and gaining a renaissance in the 1940s to the 1950s. It became quite popular in 1945 when American playwright Eugene O'Neill Jr and journalist Henry Augsburg presented the Greek tragedy Oedipus Rex in reader's theatre style on Broadway. So, let's start. We begin our play in the home of Mr. Algernon Moncrief, who lives in a flat in the very posh Half Moon Street in Westminster, London. Mr. Moncrief is playing the piano as his manservant, Lane, sets out tea and cucumber sandwiches. Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep the science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir, eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once, and that was in a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I'm sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. You've got nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Huh? Shropshire? Yes, of course. Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well. But I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I'm in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. I call that business. How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. Well, you've been eating them all this time. Well, that is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. Have some bread and butter. 
bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. And very good bread and butter it is, too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were going to eat at all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. They don't think it right. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. It's a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say that you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you would let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it, and I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. There's no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. However, it makes no matter, for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. And you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I am quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should speak of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case belongs to someone of the name of Cecily, and you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady, she is too. Lives at Tunbridge Wells. Give it back to me, Algy. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, and some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. That's absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It's Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I ever saw in my life. It's perfectly absurd your saying your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany. I'll keep this as proof your name is Ernest, if you ever attempt to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small Aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come, old boy, you had much better put the thing out at once. My dear Algy, you talk exactly as if you're a dentist. It is very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now, go on. Tell me the whole truth. I may add that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I am quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? What on earth do you mean by Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you were Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. My dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, 
made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from motives of respect you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admiral governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You're not going to be invited. Let me tell you candidly, the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bunburied all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now, go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I do not know whether you are able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And, as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to the people who haven't been at a university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunburyist. You were one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you please. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury in order that I may be able, be able to go into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at Willis's, for I have really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I have not asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It is very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dined there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I am always treated as a member of the family and sent down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well with whom she will place me next to. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband, across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who, flirts, who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunbury. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr... with your invalid friend who has that absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I've ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly will not want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. For heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It is perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you may have an opportunity at proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It is so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. 
Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I'm always smart. Aren't I, Mr. Worthing? You're quite perfect, Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, well, I hope I'm not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. I'm sorry we are a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. And I have never seen a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now, I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens. Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers. Not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its color. From what cause, of course, I cannot say. I've quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She is such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta. I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore and, I need hardly say, a terrible disappointment to me. But the fact is, I have just had a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high time this Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he is going to live or to die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Health is the primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice as far as any improvement of his ailment goes. I would be much obliged if you'd ask this Mr. Bunbury for me not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation particularly at the end of the season, when everyone has said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. The music, of course, is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen, and if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out, if you will kindly join the, me in the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. It is very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program will be delightful after a few expurgations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language and indeed I believe is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Time and date has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I've often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any girl I've ever met since I met you. Yes, I'm quite aware of the fact. And I often wish that, well, in public at any rate, you'd been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. 
the fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines, and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me he had a friend called Ernest, well, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't really mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest, do you? But your name is Ernest. Yes, I know it is. But supposing it was something different. You don't mean to say you couldn't love me then. Ah, oh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care of the name of Ernest. I don't think it suits me well at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It... It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? No, there's very little music in the name of Jack, if any at all indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. And I pity any poor woman married to a man named John. She'd probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. No, the only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There's no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely. You, you know that I love you. And you have led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you are not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you. But you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing at all has been said about marriage. The subject has not even, not, not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to tell you quite frank, frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn. Yes, Mr. Worthing. What have you got to say to me? You know what I have got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long have you been about it? I'm afraid you've had very little practice on how to propose. My own one. I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They really are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. Mr. Worthy, rise, sir, from the semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing is not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I'm engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged some, to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come up, upon a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she should be allowed to arrange for herself. And now... I have a few questions to put you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Yes, Mama. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men, although I'm, I have the same list that the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. But I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes. I must admit I smoke. I am glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? Well, uh, I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. 
I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and extracted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That is all to be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it about 1,500 acres, I believe. But I do not depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I know, the poachers are the only people who make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Well, we can get to that point afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope? A girl with simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I'd like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays there is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. Uh, the unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us or come in the evening at any rate. Now, to minor matters. Are your parents living? I've lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the Purple of Comrades, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really do not know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost both my parents. It would be near the truth to say that they seem to have lost me. I don't really know who I am by birth. I was... well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket to Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It's a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket to a seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I was in a handbag. A somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. Chaim James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. I confess, I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it has handles or not, may seem to display a contempt of the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate moment led to? And as for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now, but could hardly be regarded as an assured position in recognized good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible before, and make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I could produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, 
to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with Apostle. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. For goodness sake, don't play that ghastly tune, Algy. How idiotic you are. Didn't it go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you. I know it is a way she has. I think it is rather ill-natured of her. Oh, Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. Never met such a gorgon. I don't really know what a gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she's a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct of when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. That is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't think there's any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about uh, 150 years, do you, Algy? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty, and to someone else if she is plain. Oh, that is nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have gotten rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, my dear fellow, but it's hereditary. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say it was a severe chill. You are sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? Of course it isn't. Very well, then. My poor brother Ernest is carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said that Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? Oh, that is all right. Cecily is not a silly, romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She has a capital appetite, goes on long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to meet Cecily. I will take very good care you never do. She's excessively pretty and just only 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? Oh, one doesn't blurt these things out to people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you'd like that, half, to, half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. Women only do that when they have called each other a lot of other names first. Now, my dear boy, if we, what, we really must go and dress if we want to get a good table at Willis's. Do you know it is nearly seven? Oh, it always is nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. Miss Fairfax. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You're not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But, although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn. A story of your romantic origin, as related to me and my Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. 
I will communicate with you daily. My own one. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn around now. Thanks, I've turned round already. You may also ring the bell. You will let me see you out to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going Bunbury. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the Bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you're a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. There is a sensible intellectual girl. The only girl I've ever cared for in my life. What on earth are you so amused at? Oh, I'm a little anxious about Bunbury, that is all. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only thing that are never serious. Oh, that is nonsense, Algy. You never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. Oh, that Mr. Oscar Wilde does turn a phrase, doesn't he? So Jack, also known as Ernest, is in love with Gwendolyn, much to the displeasure of her mother, Lady Bracknell, and Algernon has his sights set on the young ward, Cecily Cardew. My goodness, the complications of the aristocracy. How difficult their lives become. Well, at this time, why not let's take a brief interlude? Push pause on your device and grab a cucumber sandwich or two, then come on back to see what happens. I trust you had a pleasant interlude. As we were preparing this production, we wanted to provide our design students with the opportunity to be engaged, given the circumstances as they are. So, we created a design project. The instructions are as follows. You are a theater designer, presenting ideas to the director of this production of Ernest. You come with an open mind, not an empty one. Demonstrate with visuals your thoughts on costumes, or what the world of the play looks like. Tonight, we have two such demonstrations. Each student has recorded their own presentation. The first one we will see is from Ella Bailey on costumes. Let's watch. Okay, so this is my Sicily costume ideas. So for this first picture, I think that it's just really delicate and it like fits her style and like her free spirit. And then the second picture, I really like the hat and the dainty earrings and like the lace and the dress. And the second picture is just like the same picture, but it's the bottom half. And I just like the sleeves and everything. And just like the simplicity of the dress, I think it really fits her personality. And then if we were to do some jewelry, I like the earrings that was shown in the picture before. And this necklace is just really dainty and I think it fits her personality. Then to talk about fabrics, I really like this lace if we were to make something, which I know we're not right now because of covid but um like in for future reference if we ever need it um i really like the lace it just like it's really simple again and i think it fits her and if you just put that over layer like over like a silk or something or just like a really simple kind of off-white fabric color i think that would look really good so this was a picture i found which was kind of my inspiration for everything on the left or sorry on the right is cecily and I just really like the simplicity of her outfit and like her hair looks just like explains her kind of free spirit personality and how she's not like your typical Victorian style lady like Lady Brecknell is or Gwendolyn. And I really just think that this costume fits her style and her personality. Simply lovely work, Ella, thank you. And now back to the importance of being earnest. As for act two, we are now in Woolton, an affluent part of Liverpool in Northern England. A lovely part of the country, rolling hills, beautiful estates, and sheep. Many, many sheep. We are at the manor house of Jack Worthing, left to him by Mr. Thomas Cardew. In the garden, we find Mr. Worthing's ward, Cecily Cardew, and her governess, Miss Prism. Let's watch. Cecily. Cecily, surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watching of flowers is rather Moulton's duty than yours, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar's on the table. Pray, open it to page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. 
But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he's leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I'm sure certainly you would. You know German and geology, and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I am not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should surely forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened, or couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that others send us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily, and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see D. Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Dr. Chasuble, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well? Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that, and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <coughs> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet? We do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sundays in London. He's not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all accounts an unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Algeria and her pupil any longer. Algeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical illusion, merely drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong. I think, dear Doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy, horrid geography, horrid, horrid German. Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany West. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was very anxious to speak with you privately for a moment. 
Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you'd better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him? Yes, miss. I've never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. He does! You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I'm not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But yes, I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother, my wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I am not really wicked at all. You mustn't think I'm wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked, and really being good all this time. That would be hypocrisy. Oh, I suppose I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. In fact, now you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you're here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment. I am obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement, if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But I still think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak with you about your immigrating. About my what? Your immigrating. He's gone up to buy you an outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy me an outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think he will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, at dinner on Wednesday night, he said that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh, well. The accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. That is because I'm hungry. How thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have, bu have a buttonhole first? I never have an appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A Marais No, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. You are too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. A misanthrope, I can understand. A womanthrope, never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often I've been told, not even to her. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended upon. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. But where is Cecily? Perhaps she followed us to the schools. Mr. Worthing. Mr. Worthing. This is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. Dr. Chasuble, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. All shameful debts and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead. Your brother Ernest, dead? Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Dear Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolences. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you are always the most forgiving and generous of brothers. 
Poor Ernest. He had his many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No. He died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity! None of us are perfect. I, myself, am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. Will the internment take place here? No. He seemed to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I fear that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the men in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion, joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. I have preached at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation and festal days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral as a charity sermon for the prevention of the discontent among the upper orders. The bishop, who was present, was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Ah, that reminds me. You mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Tossable. I suppose you know how to christen all right. I mean, after all, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in the parish. I have often spoken to the poor classes on the subject. But they don't seem to know what thrift is. But is there any particular infant in whom you are interested in, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But it is not for any child, dear doctor. I'm very fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you've been christened already? I don't remember a thing about it. But have you any grave doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way, or if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all. The sprinkling, and indeed the immersion of adults, is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehensions. Sprinkling is all that I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. At what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? Oh, I might trot round about five, if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A pair of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Jenkins the Carter, a most hard-working man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened with other babies. It would be childish. Would half past five do? Admirably, admirably. And now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely beg you not to be too much bowed down by grief. What seems to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Uncle Jack! Oh, I am pleased to see you back. But what horrid clothes you've got on. Do go and change them. Cecily! My child! My child! What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you had a toothache. And I've got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense! I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother is in the dining room. I don't know what this all means. I think it is perfectly absurd. Good heavens. Brother John... I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I have caused you, and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming down here disgraceful, and he knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there there must be much good in a man who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit at a bed of pain. Oh, he's been talking to you about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury? Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or anything else. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit that all the faults were on my side. But I must admit, I think that Brother John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. Especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I shall never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. 
Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You've done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. You young scoundrel, Algy, you must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bunbury in here. I've put Mr. Ernest things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and placed it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, or to the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the slightest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You're not to talk of Miss Cardew in that way. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go, go up and change? It is perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for someone who is actually staying at your house as a guest for a week. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You've got to leave by the 4-5 train. I certainly won't leave you so long as you were in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I should think it most unfriendly if I didn't, if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you are not too long. I never saw anybody take so long to dress, and with such little result. Well, at any rate, that is better than always being overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous, your conduct an outrage, and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you've got to catch the four or five, and I hope you have a pleasant journey back to town. This bunburying, as you call it, has not been of great success to you. I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is all that matters. But I must see her before I go, and make arrangements for another Bunbury. Ah, there she is. Oh, I merely came back to order the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from the people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you, Cecily. The dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you a great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks in my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. May I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and is consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I'm quite ready for more. <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Cecily, ever since I first w looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, Hopelessly. I don't think that you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew that you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Uncle Jack. I don't care for anybody in the whole world but you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy, of course. Why, we've been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? 
Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But when was the engagement actually settled? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And certainly a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels that there must be something in her after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling, and when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire, ignorant of my, entire ignorance of my existence, I was determined to end the matter one way or another. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day I bought this little ring in your name, and this is the little bangle of the true love was not I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for you leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. My letters? But my own sweet Cecily, I have never written you any letters. Oh, you need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, I couldn't possibly. That would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement were so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you'd like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. But why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? Indeed, I had done nothing at all. Cecily, I am very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off. Particularly when the weather was so charming. It would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't have been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Yes, darling. With a little help from others. I'm so glad. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily. Oh, I don't think I could now that I have actually met you. Besides, of course, there is always the question of your name. Yes, of course. You must not laugh at me, darling. But it has always been the girlish dream of mine to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But, my dear child, do you mean to say you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, loving little darling, I really don't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It is not at all a bad name. It is rather an aristocratic name. More than half the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. But seriously, Cecily, if I was called Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But I'm afraid I would not be able to give you my undivided attention. <coughs> Cecily, your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in all the rites and ceremonials of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Charlesville is the most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on a most important christening. I mean, on most important business. Oh. I shan't be away more than half an hour. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th, and that I have only met you today for the first time, I feel it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must enter his proposal in my diary. A Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthy. On very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Is it Mr. Worthing in his library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Pray, ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon. And you can bring tea? Yes, miss. Miss Fairfax, I suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are associated in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. Miss Fairfax... 
Pray, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew! Oh, what a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other for such a comparatively short time. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Now, then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. I suppose this would be a favourable opportunity of my mentioning of who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You've never heard of Papa, I suppose? I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I'm glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me the proper sphere for the man, does it not? And certainly once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate. And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. Cecily, Ma, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of her system. So, do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I'm very fond of being looked at. You're here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female rel relative of advanced years resides here also. Oh, no. I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I'm Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh! Oh, it is strange. He never mentioned to me he had a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I'm not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I'm very fond of you, Cecily. I've liked you ever since I've met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly. Pray do. I feel that whenever anyone has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and a little more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me he had a brother. I'm sorry to say that they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Cecily... You've lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, there's no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. A little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. My darling Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do. I never travel without my diary. Something, some, one must always have something sensational to read on the train. I'm so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once, and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I shall never reproach him with it until after we are married. Did you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? 
You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. You suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrap Jonas into an engagement? How dare you! This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I'm glad to say I've never seen a spade. It is obvious to me our social spheres have been widely different. Shall I lay the tea here as usual, miss? Yes, as usual. Are there many interesting walks in this vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I'm afraid I wouldn't like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. And quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country. If anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering from it very much just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl, but I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. Hand that to Miss Fairfax. You have filled my tea with lumps of sugar, and though I asked most distinctly for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lengths to which I will not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful. I'm never deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have any other, any other calls of a similar nature to make in the neighborhood. <gasps> Ernest! My own Ernest! Gwendolyn, darling. A moment. May I ask if you're engaged to be married to this young lady? To dear little Cecily? Of course not. What could have put such an idea in your pretty little head? Thank you. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present around your waist is my dear guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh! Here is Ernest. My own love. A moment, Ernest. May I ask you, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I mean, to Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. I felt there must be some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman you are now embracing is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh! Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh. Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. But my name certainly is John. It's been John for years. A gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. Sweet wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister now, will you not? There is just one question I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea, Mr. Worthing. There is just one question I'd like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest. So it is a question of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life that I have been reduced to such a painful position, and I'm really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. I have never had a brother in my life and I certainly have not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? None. Have you never had a brother of any kind? Never, not even of any kind. I'm afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl to suddenly find herself in, is it? 
Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? This ghastly state of things is what you call bunburying, I suppose. Yes, and a perfectly wonderful bunbury it is. The most wonderful bunbury I have ever had in my life. Well, you've no right whatsoever to bunbury here. That is absurd. One has a right to bunbury wherever one chooses. Every serious bunburyist knows that. Serious bunburyist? Good heavens. Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. I happen to be serious about Bunbury. What on earth you are so serious about, I haven't got the smallest knowledge. About everything, I should fancy. You have such an absolutely trivial nature. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury has quite exploded. You won't be able to go down to the country quite as often as you used to. And a very good thing, too. Your brother is a little off-color, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear to London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was, and not a bad thing either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I must say that your taking in of a sweet, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable. To say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defense at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young woman like Miss Fairfax, to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, that is all. I love her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of your ever marrying Miss Cardew. I don't think there is much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax ever being united. Well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. It is very vulgar to talk about one's business. Only people like stock brokers do that, and then merely at dinner parties. How you can sit there, calmly eating muffins when we're in this horrible situation, I cannot make out. It seems to me that you are perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get on my cuffs. One must always eat muffins quite calmly. It is the only way to eat them. I say it's perfectly heartless you eating muffins at all, under the circumstances. When I am in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed, when I am in great trouble, as anyone who intimately knows me will tell you, I refuse everything except food and drink. At the present moment, I am eating it because I am unhappy. Besides, I am particularly fond of muffins. Well, that is no reason you should eat them all in that greedy way. I wish you would have tea cake. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens! I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you have just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you, under the circumstances. That is a very different thing. That may be, but the muffins are the same. Algie, I wish to goodness you would go. You can't possibly ask me to go without having dinner. It's absurd. I never go without my dinner. No one ever does except vegetarians and people like that. Besides, I have just made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened myself at 5.30, and I naturally will take the name of Ernest. Gwend Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened Ernest, that's absurd. Besides, I have the perfect right to be christened if I'd like. There's no evidence at all that I've ever been christened by anybody. I should think it probable I never was, and so does Dr. Chasuble. It is a entirely different in your case, and you have been christened already. Yes, but I have not been christened for years. Yes, but you have been christened. That's the important part. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you are not quite so sure about your ever having been christened, I must say I think it's rather dangerous you're venturing on it now. You can hardly have forgotten that someone very closely connected with you was nearly carried off this week by a severe chill. Yes, but you said yourself that a severe chill is not hereditary. It usen't to be, I know. But I dare say it is now. Science is always making wonderful improvements in things. Oh, that is nonsense. You're always talking nonsense. Jack, you are at the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. There are only two left. I told you I was particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. Why on earth do you allow tea cake to be served up for your guests? What ideas you have of hospitality. Algernon, I've already told you to go. I don't want you here. Why won't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet, and there is still one muffin left. Oh, 
What a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Extra credit points for the first person who can tell me who wrote that brilliant line. So, both our young men are off to be christened and renamed Ernest. And after a rather rocky, if not polite start, our two young women are destined to be great friends after all. At this time, let's take another brief interlude. Push pause on your device and have a biscuit. I will be here when you return. Welcome back. I trust you're enjoying your viewing of this production of The Importance of Being Earnest. I know I am. Before we continue with Act 3, let us watch our second design video from Megan Eikens, who did her project on the scenic design. Okay, so for my project, I did uh, the set design for Algernon's flat. So some preliminary questions. The play takes place well, this particular scene takes place in upper class flat in London, England in the 1890s. I chose to do it in a realistic fashion. So I found out that The Importance of Being Nurse was written in 1893 by Oscar Wilde and based my design off of that. I looked through the script and found out that I needed a sofa, chairs, a table and fi a fireplace to stage the action in. For the tone of the work, I chose to do it very gaudy because I got the impression that Algernon was a very arrogant, stuffy person. And he would, he would want to be like on the edge of the trends during that time period. So gaudy was what I decided to do. This was influenced by how the play is a satire. So I wanted to kind of reinforce that with my design. So here's my research. So as you can see, I found some like Victorian style furniture, as well as some uh, rooms that I, this one in particular, I took a lot of uh, inspiration from because of all the gold and everything. And we have uh, our like period inspired piece like right here. This is not actually a house, but like a meeting place. But still, I liked it and it helped me figure out what I wanted to do. And I uh, found some particular pieces from the pictures that I really liked. And so I put them in the bigger so I can really look at them. And yeah, that's what I did for my research. So this was my final design that I drew out. So I got the feeling gold was very good and well as like a magenta pink. So I did like the pink walls and stripes. So it'd just be very, very like overdone and you get a lot out of it. Right here, I was thinking that it could potentially be like a portrait painting of Algernon himself, just to really enforce the fact that he cares a lot about what others think of him and how he is seen in this society. Thank you for listening. Splendid work, Megan, thank you. So, act three. We are now inside the manor house, the morning room to be exact. Cecily and Gwendolyn are looking out the window at Jack and Algernon, who are, as we left them, in the garden, tormenting one another. Such nonsense. How will this ever resolve itself? It may take an act of the highest power, or Lady Bracknell. Let's watch. The fact that they did not follow us at once into the house, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins, that looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? But I haven't a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery. They're approaching. That is very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. 
The signified silence seems to have produced an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing, I have something very particular to ask of you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity at meeting you. That certainly seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't. But that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have the opportunity of coming up to town to visit me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I'm more than content with what, with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then, you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True. I'd forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Or which of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time for me? Certainly. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Our Christian names? Is that all? But we are going to be Christian this afternoon. For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing. I am. To please me, you are ready to face this fearful ordeal. I am. How absurd to talk of equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have moments of physical courage in which we women know nothing. Darling. Darling. <clears throat> Lady Bracknell. Good heavens. Gwendolyn, what does this mean? Merely that I'm engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mamma. Apprised, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by a luggage train. But of course, you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, and indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon, Algernon. Yes, Aunt Augusta. May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh. Oh, no. Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury is somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh. I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I mean, Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Bunbury. Oh, he was quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he was well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean he was found out. The doctors found out that he could not live, that is what I mean. So Bunbury died. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at last to some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon? Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that seem to go on seem to me to be considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary enquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea a person's origin could be a terminus. <clears throat> Mr. 
Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, Southwest, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporan, Fifeshire, N.B. That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I have their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They're open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. I have known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Monsieurs Markby, Markby, and Markby. Markby, Markby, and Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mr. Markby sometimes attends dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I have also in my possession, you'll be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles. Both the German and the English variety. Ah, a life crowded with incident, I see, though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I, myself, am not in favor of premature experiences. Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. And as a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about 130,000 pounds in the funds, that is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell, so pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. 130,000 pounds, and in the funds. Miss Cardew seems to me to be one of the most attractive young lady now that I look at her. There are few girls of the present day who have really any solid qualities, any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Pretty child, your dress is sadly simple and your hair seems as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all that. I know a thoroughly experienced French maid who works marvelous results in very brief amount of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing, and within three months her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high at present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. Dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debt to depend upon. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I la married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed of letting that stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I never think is advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes legally of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, may I say, ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more could one desire? It pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But the fact is that I do not approve of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained a mission to my house under the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I have just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brut 89, a wine I was specially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded into the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. And, what makes his conduct all the more heartless is, 
that from the, he knew from the first that I have no brother, that I never had a brother, and that I do not intend to having a brother in the future, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, as a matter of form, after careful consideration, I have decided to entirely overlook my nephew's conduct to you. That is very generous of you, Lady Baracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. How old are you, dear? Well, I'm really only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate in her age. It looks so calculating. 18. But admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be long before you are of age and free from the restraint of tutelage, so I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me, Lady Bracknell, for interrupting you again, but it is only fair that I tell you that, according to the will of her grandfather, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age until she is thirty-five. That does not seem to me to be a grave objection. Thirty-five is a very attractive age. London society is full of women who, at the very highest birth, have, of their own free choice, remained thirty-five for years. Lady Doubleton is an instance to point. To my own knowledge, she's been thirty-five ever since she arrived at the age of forty, which was many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not be even still more attractive at that age than the age she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, I know. But I do like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. And what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait till she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seemed to show a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. You see, the moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us have to look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would not be pleased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand, then, that there are to be no baptisms at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Tossable. I'm grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savor the, the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I've completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as your mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I'm on my way to join her. Pray, allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies, and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been, for the last three years, Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I have been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism? Prism, where is that baby? 
28 years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104 Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, after the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained a manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than unusually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared, as usual, to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. However, in a moment of mental abstraction in which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria. The Brighton Line. I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwen Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you're not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. It is hardly considered the thing. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if you were having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They are always vulgar and often convincing. It has stopped now. I wish he would arrive at some conclusion. Your suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to me mine. Yes, here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower omnibus in younger and happier days. Here is the stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Leamington. And here, on the lock, on my initials, I had forgotten that in an extravagant mood I had had them placed there. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. <gasps> you? Yes. Mother. Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Unmarried? I do not deny this is a serious blow. But after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you. Mr. Worthing, there is some error. There is the lady who can tell you who you really are. Oh. Lady Bracken, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? I am afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. <gasps> Algie's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all. I knew I had a brother. I had always said I had a brother. Gwendolyn, how could you have ever doubted that I had a brother? Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algy, young scoundrel, you'll have to treat me with more respect in the future. You've never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit. I did my best, however, though I was out of practice. My own. But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you've become someone else? Good heavens, I'd quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, except in my affections. 
What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. Then I was christened. That is settled. Now, what name was I given? Let me know the worst. Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot at the present moment recall what the general's Christian name was, but I have no doubt he had one. He was an eccentric, I admit, but only in the later years, and that was a result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and other things of that kind. Algy, can't you recollect what your father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. His name would appear in the army list of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. The general was essentially a man of peace, but not in his domestic life. But I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army list of the last forty years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. M. Generals, Marlon, Maxwell, Megley. What ghastly names they have. Mark B. Mid, Mon Mobs, Moncrief. Lieutenant 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel. Colonel, General 1869, Christian names. Ernest John. I'd always told you, Gwendolyn, my name was Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes, I remember the General's name was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he has been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? I can, for I feel that you are sure to change. My own one. Laetitia. Frederick. At last. Cecily, at last. Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I have now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. Thank you for coming tonight. Have a pleasant evening.